Hi everyone. In today's video, I would like to show you how you can power your Raspberry Pi using a LiPo battery such as this one. I would like to cover three topics today. First, how you can create 5 volts from this battery pack, which you will need to power the Raspberry Pi. Second, how you can deliver that 5 volts into the Pi. And third, how to monitor the battery voltage of the battery pack to ensure that you don't over discharge it. At the end, I will also briefly touch on Arduino. Most of the video applies in exactly the same way to Arduino as well. The first thing I should talk about though is fuses. If you have a dodgy connection somewhere or a short circuit, then a LiPo battery like this one easily has enough oomph in it to turn that into a fire. So to protect yourself from that, you need a fuse. Now I really like to use an automotive blade fuse like this in one of these holders. And then on the left side over here, I have soldered on a Dean's T connector because that is the connector that my battery has. And then on the right side, I have a pair of crimp ferrules. And these crimp ferrules can then go into a terminal block like so. Or if you want a little bit more convenience, you can also use a pluggable terminal block like this. So the ferrules go in here and then you can plug them in like this and then this end is soldered into the PCB. My favorite component for actually generating 5 volts is this guy, the TSR2-2450. It works very easily. You just put the input voltage on the left side between 7 and 36 volts. The middle is ground and then on the right side you will get 5 volts on the output. It works very similarly to another component that you might know the L7805 linear regulator. The difference between the two mostly is that the left one is about 95% efficient while the right one, depending on the input voltage, can be 50% efficient or worse. And the problem with that is that of course you waste some power but the bigger issue is that you generate a lot of heat inside of this component and so to counteract that you will need a heavy heat sink like this. So, I really like to use the TSR2450. The downside of it is that it is about 10 to 12 dollars, so that is quite expensive. Another option is to use a standalone DC DC converter module. So, here is a random one that I got from uh, AliExpress at some point. Uh, and here is a slightly more professional brick that I got from Meanwell at some point. These are especially convenient if you don't have any PCBs of your own planned on which you would mount something small like this. Another package that's perhaps quite convenient is this one. This is a small DC-DC converter where you have the input here and on the right side you have a USB output. And that will be a little easier later on when it's time to deliver the power into the Pi. The final option relevant to RC aficionados is the battery eliminator circuit output from an electronic speed controller. So here we see that this thing has a DEC of 2 amps at 5 volts and it comes out of this 3 pin wire over here and of course these 3 connectors over here would go to the brushless motor. So these 3 pins over here are the ground on the right, the 5 volt output in the middle and then the white wire here would be an input into the speed controller which governs the speed. And sure enough, if we put the probes of the multimeter on here, we see an output of 5 volts. One thing I do want to point out in this particular case is that if you have multiple electronic speed controllers, you need to make sure that only one of them is connected to power the Pi. In general, it's a very bad idea to have multiple power supplies in parallel. Now that we have a way to create 5 volts, we need a way to deliver it into the Pi. And there are two ways to get in. The obvious one, of course, is the USB port. But the other way to get in is via the 5 volt pins on the GPIO header. Now these are usually regarded and portrayed as outputs, but they work equally well as inputs. But again, keep in mind that you should not put multiple power supplies in parallel. So don't put one supply in the USB port and another supply in the 5 volts. They will start fighting each other. 
Another method to get in that I have never used and that I don't recommend is to solder your wires directly to some of the test points on the back of the Raspberry Pi. I first wish to warn you about a common pitfall which is using wires or connectors that have too much resistance. So cheap DuPont wires like these generally have very thin conductors, sometimes not even made of pure copper, and so these will have a relatively high resistance. And the same thing happens when you use cheap USB cables. So here I have my Raspberry Pi hooked up via these DuPont wires to my power supply using otherwise very thick wiring. And the power supply is set to 5 volts 5 amps. And the multimeter here is just verifying that what you're about to see is not the power supply's fault. The problem here is these thin wires. So what I want you to note especially is what happens when the current goes up because what you'll see hopefully is that as soon as the current picks up the Raspberry Pi will shut down and reboot. So the lightning symbol is already visible and the current will now increase. and there it went into reboot. So in this particular case it's quite borderline, sometimes it'll reboot on you faster than this, but nevertheless this is obviously not a desirable outcome. And it will just keep on rebooting and rebooting like this. Let's go over what just happened. We had a 5 volt power supply connected to the Raspberry Pi but we connected it via a few wires that had a lot of resistance and I just measured them to be 0.4 ohms on the wire going to the positive side and 1.7 ohms for the wire coming from the ground side. Now if the current is quite low, like 100 milliamps, which is roughly the current we saw at the beginning, that means that the drop is 0.1 amps times a total of 2.1 ohms is 0.21 volts. And that means that the Raspberry Pi sees about 4.79 volts. And this is not ideal perhaps, but it is enough for the Pi to work on. When the current rises though, the voltage drop increases. And at the end we saw a current of about 600 milliamps or so. And in that case, the voltage drop is 1.26 volts. And at that point, only 3.74 volts is left for the Pi to work on. And this is simply not enough, so the Pi shuts down. But the moment the Pi shuts down, the current goes back down again. And then we're back into the first situation where there is enough voltage for the Pi to work. And so then the Pi starts up again. And this process simply keeps repeating over and over. Even if you have good wires, you will still get some losses. And many of these purpose-built power supplies for the wall socket that you will get for a Raspberry Pi actually supply slightly more than 5 volts. In this particular case here, we see this supply supplies 5.2 volts to compensate for the losses in this rather long wire. And going back to the meanwhile power brick that we had, you can turn up the adjustment potentiometer slightly, again to compensate for the losses in the wires. One option for delivering the power to your Pi is to use a USB cable like this one. Again, for the sake of the resistance, try to get one that is as short as possible and has power conductors that are as thick as possible. If you buy the cheapest one you can find, you can get something as bad as 30 AWG on the power conductors but a good USB cable will have something like 24 AWG and if you specifically look for it you can get 22 and 20 AWG. Now for actually connecting this to the supply you have a few options. Of course if you use this buck converter that we've seen before it's straightforward you can just plug it in right here. And what you can also do if you have something like a TSR 2450 on a PCB is you can just add a USB-A output port to the PCB. Another option you have is to just cut the cable in two and then expose the two power conductors. 
and then you can for example add crimp ferrules to those and then you can put them into a screw terminal or a pluggable screw terminal like this which is again fairly simple to use. Another option is to use a micro USB to terminal block adapter like this one. All you have to do is plug that into the Pi and then you can connect your 5 volt and ground to the outer pins. The other way to get 5 volts into the Pi is via the 5 volt pins on the 40 pin GPIO header. And I've just shown you how you can do that with DuPont wires. But those have a rather large resistance, as I've shown you, and they are also mechanically just quite unsound and untidy, so I really don't like you doing it in that way. One method that I do like is using a hat, such as this Adafruit Permaproto hat, and so all I have to do is solder the TSR22450 somewhere on there and then make sure that the 5 volt output is routed into this 5 volt rail over here. And of course the ground rail is right beside it, so that's quite convenient. Here we're looking into one of my other robots, and here is the power inputs. And then the wires going out here are actually going into the motor controller because those also need power from the battery. And then here we have the TSR22450 again. And then it's wired so that the power goes into the 5 volt and ground below here. Um, I do have some wires running here to carry signals to the motor controller. But uh, without the motor controller I wouldn't have these and then you have a really neat, tidy and sound solution to get the power into your Pi. If you need more prototyping space, you can also use your own separate PCB, and then you can add a 40-pin header to that PCB, and that allows you to connect it to the Raspberry Pi using a piece of ribbon cable like this. And again, that creates a mechanically sound and neat connection that also has relatively low resistance. In particular, note that the header has two plus five volt pins, and it has multiple ground pins, so I highly recommend that you use both of the 5 volt pins and two or more of the ground pins to make the connection. Again, less resistance is better. The final option I'd like to show you is just these two open ends here going into a 2.54 millimeter pitch here. And then you can simply connect that up to the Raspberry Pi like this. Notice here I'm skipping the outer pin here, so I'm using one 5 volt and the ground pin directly beside it. And this is only possible because there is a 5 volt pin right next to a ground pin on the header. Now the resistance in this technique is quite marginal, so I generally don't recommend it. Again, keep the wires thick and keep your connections short, then you should still be okay. In this particular case, as with the previous one, Pay close attention to the polarity. If you get the polarity wrong, you will fry your pie. The last topic I wish to cover is how to monitor the battery voltage so that you don't over discharge it. On the left here, I have the circuit that we built last time, which is an MCP3208 connected to the Raspberry Pi so that it can measure analog voltages. And on the right here, I have the same chip, the MCP3208, connected to a 40-pin header. And this is the circuit that will go into the hot goblin. Now, in addition to that, over here, I have two resistors of 8.2 and 1.1 kilo ohm, And these together form a resistor divider. And they divide down the battery voltage into the 3.3 volt range that this chip can measure in this particular configuration. Here I have that circuit board hooked up to a Raspberry Pi via the ribbon cable. And here I have my power supply set now to 25 volts 5 amps. So 25 volts is roughly in line with what my target battery pack would be using. So if we turn this on, we should hopefully see the TV turn on with an image. Here is basically the same code as last time. So we read the channel from the MCP3208 and then convert it to a voltage. So that is the voltage that the MCP3208 is actually measuring. And then we multiply it by the resistor divider uh, and that gives us the actual voltage of the battery pack. 
So we need to know what kind of resistor divider we are using to be able to calculate backwards what the original voltage was. And then I've added a little limit there to show you that you can do stuff based on the battery voltage. So now let's run this. And so now you see roughly 24.8, 24.9 volts. So it's slightly less than what the, um, what the power supply is set for. Let me just go over there so it's focused. And then I can go into the power supply and start slowly dialing around with the voltage. And you can see that it immediately changes. And so in this way, as the battery voltage changes, we can detect that. And once the battery voltage goes too low, we can start giving a warning like that. And of course, you can also take other actions such as disabling your motors. Let's finally talk about the Arduino boards. Both of these boards have a USB input, just like the Raspberry Pi, and it works in the same way. And both of them also have a 5 volt input pin that also works exactly the same way as the Raspberry Pi's 5 volt pin in that it's usually regarded or used as an output but it works as an input all the same. Now earlier in the video I described the L7805 uh, as a basically less efficient version of the TSR22450. And both of these Arduino boards have a component like the L7805, the AMS1117. And so it's over here on the Mega, and on the Nano, it's on the back side here. Now, these are both quite small packages, and the issue comes in when you draw either quite a lot of current from the 5-volt rail, or if your input voltage is quite high. So you can feed in your voltage uh, between 7 to roughly 12 volts on the V-in pin that you will also find on the headers. But as that voltage goes higher or you draw more current from the 5 volt output, you risk overheating these regulators because as you can see, they are not that large. And so if you are in such a situation, then you are basically forced to use a 5 volt regulator of your own and then use either the 5 volt pins or the USB inputs to supply the power. Note that the Arduinos come with analog inputs out of the box, so you don't need a separate analog to digital converter like the MCP3208 to measure the battery voltage. You do need a resistor divider though to divide the voltage down into the proper range. Also note that these Arduinos generally operate on 5 volt logic and the Pis operate on 3.3 volt logic. So you need to change the ratios of the divider to divide the battery voltage to maximum of 5 volts instead of a maximum of 3.3 volts. That's all I have for you today. If you know of another way to create 5 volts from a battery or a different way to deliver that voltage into the Raspberry Pi, please let everyone know down below. With that, I'd like to thank you again for watching. I hope to see you next time, and have a good night.